Sustainability, a top priority for China and its 1.4 billion people. Eliminating poverty, providing quality education, battling climate change, protecting plants and animals and the ecosystem, investing in green development. China is leading the way. Welcome to CGTN America's Global Action Initiative 2022 on Sustainability. I'm Anand Naidu. From education to climate action, China is working to deliver on the 17 UN Sustainable Development Goals approved by the General Assembly in 2015. With just eight years until the 2030 deadline, the task is of huge importance to the planet and future generations. Ahead, we'll hear from several UN leaders on China's achievements on sustainability and discuss Beijing's top priorities. We begin with the UN Biodiversity Conference, COP15. Environmental leaders from around the world are meeting in Canada to discuss how to protect plants, animals and their fragile habitats. A United Nations report warns a million species are in danger of extinction and the window is closing to safeguard biodiversity. Environmental ministers are working to negotiate an agreement. They're building on the Kunming Declaration, an urgent call to action on biodiversity protection approved by over 100 countries in Kunming, China in 2021. At that time, Chinese President Xi Jinping pledged $233 million for the Kunming Biodiversity Fund to help developing countries. Delegates are now trying to advance the post-2020 global biodiversity framework to protect 30% of the planet's land and sea by 2030, a target known as 30 by 30. They're also discussing how much funding to go towards conservation. China holds the rotating presidency and is overseeing the talks. Chinese President Xi Jinping addressed the COP15 conference and called for a global consensus on biodiversity protection. President Xi also shared the active efforts China has taken to promote ecological progress and biodiversity protection. President Xi said, China has continuously strengthened biodiversity mainstreaming, applied a system of ecological conservation red lines, established a protected area system with national parks, and carried out major biodiversity projects. A large number of rare and endangered species are under effective protection, and the diversity, stability, and sustainability of the ecosystem are continuously improving. President Xi said China will launch a large number of key projects on biodiversity protection and restoration and support international forums on biodiversity. Delegates at COP15 are hoping to have an agreement before the conference ends. Good health and well-being, sustainable cities and communities, affordable and clean energy are just a few of the sustainable development goals China is working to realize. The UN Deputy Secretary General Amina Mohammed talks about one of China's biggest successes. It's number one on the SDG list, no poverty. It was amazing what China was able to do um, because that's actually how the goal for poverty um, on the MDGs was achieved, was the efforts that came out of China. Um, I think China has many examples of how this could work. Um, not every country would be able to, um, to achieve those, uh, those goals um, in the same way. Um, so I think there are lessons learned and many could, um, could gain from that. Um, and I think what the UN tries to do is to share those best practices around the world around the framing of what we've got to get done as goal number one of the SDGs. Uh, so yes, lessons learned. Um, and in particular, you know, what were those key ingredients to um, taking people out of poverty? Education was one. Putting a square nutritious meal on the table was another. So there are things that we can all do and that were examples of, of what helped um, China pull people out of poverty. And, and I think the biggest lesson we have to learn is how you did it at scale. And, and that's a big one. It's not to do a few people, it's to do everyone above the poverty line and giving them an opportunity. We now turn to Elizabeth Maruma Imrema, the UN Executive Secretary on the Convention on Biological Diversity. She shared her thoughts on China's accomplishments in biodiversity. China has done a lot in terms of, I will say, biodiversity conservation, particularly at national level. 
few examples. With the Aichi biodiversity targets, protected areas, for instance, the target was 17% land or terrestrial uh, ecosystem and 10% uh, marine ecosystem. As of now, we are just about to reach the 17% target, and this is after two years uh, of the deadline of 2020, and also about equally, but few more percentages to be covered to reach the, uh, the marine areas. But China had already expanded its protected areas to 25% even before 2020, well beyond the global target. Let's look at uh, pandas. Panda had gone to extinction at one time in China. As we speak, they have recovered uh, the, the panda and a number of other species that now you visit China, you can see them, that species have recovered and even almost uh, re being removed from the IUCN red list of uh, species threatened with extinction. We have seen China also expanding their red hills, red uh, uh, conservation areas, uh, also created many other new, in the different provinces, national parks uh, for wildlife management. We now turn to Akim Steiner, administrator of the UN Development Programme. He spoke with my colleague, CGTN's Xu Deji, about the importance of sustainable development and how China is helping developing countries. As somebody who you know, leads an organization that is engaged in 170 countries supporting sustainable development, I can tell you that on virtually every radar screen, on every monitoring and indicator um, graph, I can tell you we are not doing enough. We are losing biodiversity, we are losing ecosystems. People often don't realize what this means. You know, the air we breathe, all the food we eat grows on soils. If we deplete our soils, we are depleting our capacity to grow food, not just to have trees and forests grow. Um, if we don't manage our watersheds, um, our hydrological cycles, the water that we essentially maybe get out of a tap will not be there anymore. That is the consequence of losing biodiversity. And as UNDP, we are very keen to help governments and to help countries reset the economic incentives and policies that will allow an economy to thrive in the 21st century while protecting biodiversity. There is this notion of sustainable use of biodiversity. That has to be the central criterion for fiscal policy, for taxation, for land use planning, for investment in protected areas. If we advance on those targets, then there is some hope that maybe in the coming years we will finally reach a point where now 8 billion people can survive on this planet without destroying the very foundations of life, uh, which is really the story of the last 100, 200 years. So what can China help the UNDP to achieve the, the goals for biodiversity? I think, first of all, the partnership that UNDP has had with China over the last 40 years is already a demonstration of where we have worked uh, with one another, both in sharing um, ideas, experiences, best practices, but then also uh, contributing to the design of national policies in China. When China leads in its own national development planning on biodiversity conservation, on restoring ecosystems, on addressing deforestation, it is not only helping China's national sustainable development pathway, it also has global implications in terms of its impact on biodiversity, loss of species, carbon emissions. So we have had a very successful partnership I think as we move forward, we obviously welcome China's engagement also in the way that it will work with the Global Development Initiative um, aligned to the outcomes of not only the 2030 Agenda, the Sustainable Development Goals, but also the outcomes of COP27, uh, now the COP15 Biodiversity Convention, because China is a partner to many developing countries today. Applying best practices in this partnership, in this cooperation, I think will significantly also assist developing countries in addressing their own uh, development uh, transitions and um, development investments that they need to undertake in this field. And I think in that sense, both at the national level 
uh, as China implements its own strategies, but also in the international cooperation, um, it can play a very significant role. China has quickly become a global leader in sustainability and has made incredible advancements in science, technology and innovation in the fight against climate change. Let's take a closer look. You only have to look up at the skies of Beijing to see how far China has come with climate action. Vibrant blue skies, urban forests, solar and wind energy, electric vehicles. China is moving fast to meet the goals of the UN's 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development. A 10-year fishing ban is in place on the Yangtze River to restore the fishing population. The wetlands protection law shelters migratory birds and hundreds of other species. And a national park system is safeguarding wildlife. Across China, a massive reforestation project is underway with the planting and conservation of 70 billion trees. Beijing is investing in green development projects across Africa, Asia and Latin America. Already, 149 countries have joined China's Belt and Road Initiative. Electric vehicles are answering the call to decarbonize transport. China is the largest market for electric cars and electric buses. Some of them are in Qatar at the 2022 FIFA World Cup. And Beijing hosted the greenest Winter Olympics in history. The 2022 Winter Games were the first to exclusively power all venues with clean energy from renewable sources. Carbon dioxide technology also created ice for several of the skating arenas. For more on China's efforts in sustainability, let's bring in our esteemed guests. Joining us from New York is Robert Lawrence Kuhn. He's a China expert, international corporate strategist and author. From Chennai, India, Eric Solheim served as the Under Secretary General at the United Nations and is currently president of the Green Belt and Road Institute. With us from Beijing, Enrique Dussel Peters is a professor with the Graduate School of Economics at the National Autonomous University of Mexico and currently a visiting professor at Peking University. And from Shenzhen, Chang Wa Wu is the CEO of the Beijing Innovation Center. Thanks to all of you for being with us. Uh, Chang Wa Wu, back in uh, 2021, the Chinese President Xi Jinping announced a series of very ambitious plans to bring a green and low carbon economy to China. He told the United Nations General Assembly, China will strive to peak carbon dioxide emissions before 2030 and achieve carbon neutrality before 2060. Can you give us a sense of how much progress has been made to meet these goals? Definitely. Uh Decarbonization has become the uniting uh, theme uh, that the government decided to pull everything together. Uh, a major progress made so far uh, could be demonstrated by the 14th five-year plan uh, system. There's a whole body of national development plans between 2021 and 2025. That's pretty much formed the foundation uh, for a systemic change or transition in this country to get ready to make sure we'll be able to deliver uh, the peaking of emissions before 2030. Of course, that will set the foundation for achieving carbon neutrality leading up to 2060. Uh, in that context in particular, uh, Energy uh, transition is a, a major piece of the puzzle because 40, 40, 45 percent of the emissions in China coming from the power sector, particular fossil fuels there. So that's absolutely the priority at this moment. In the meantime, if you look at the other heavy emitter industries, they are pretty much high up on the agenda, getting ready to be included in the national emissions trading market to make sure we really come up with the pricing of carbon to make sure we drive the shift accelerate the decarbonization as much as possible. In the meantime, the country has been paying more and more attention to the role of nature, particularly the current COP15 in Montreal, that's going to address the nature part. On one side, of course, we need to halt and reverse loss of nature. But in the meantime, we need to enhance nature-based solutions to help mitigate and adapt to climate change there as well. Uh, so in a nutshell, I think today China is well positioned uh, to championing the decarbonization process through a more systemic change because the national plan is pretty much to get all the pieces of the puzzle together in order to deliver the, uh, the ambitions and the commitments. 
Eric Solheim, in that same address to the United Nations, President Xi proposed a global development initiative embracing multilateralism and global partnerships. You know, clearly a recognition that it's not just one country that can do this, it has to be a global effort. Uh, but how will these global partnerships uh, help implement the overall UN sustainability goals? China has been achieving results when it comes to poverty elevation like no other nation in human history. Look, in the last uh, 40 years, China's brought close to a billion people out of extreme poverty. There's not one single extreme poor person left in China. That's absolutely amazing. That means the world has a lot to learn from China. The rest of the world cannot cope with China, but they can still learn a lot of lessons from China. And secondly, China, of course, has a lot to offer to the world in the form of investment. And I fully share the view that China is now a front runner when it comes not just to poverty alleviation, but to in, when it comes to the green transformation of the world. China is dominant on every single green technology. Last year, 82% of all solar panels in the world were made in China, 70% of all electric batteries were made in China, and China is the totally dominating nation when there is electric buses, high-speed rail, so, uh, wind, solar, uh, green hydrogen, hydropower, whatever is the green technology, China is in the lead. And frankly, Europe, the United States, the rest of us, we need to get up early in the morning to compete with China. If I allow, I think there are two main reasons why China has done this fantastic change uh, on the environment. One is there was a clear message from the people of China, pollution is too heavy. Ten years ago, Chinese cities were very polluted, and the people sent a message to the leadership, we won't change, please start a war on pollution. And the government responded and brought down pollution. And secondly, for China, this green transformation is not just about the <coughs> environment, it's also about the economy. China, for instance, has no historical car industry. It will be difficult to capture the market in the old industry. But of course, China can capture all the market in the new electric industry, in green hydrogen, in, high, in wind, solar, all the new industries. So driven by the fight against pollution and driven by the opportunity to capture market and provide prosperity to China by going green, uh, China is now a world leader on basically everything in the green sector. Robert Lawrence Kuhn, of course, you are one of the experts uh, on China's success in lifting hundreds of millions of people out of poverty. You made an acclaimed documentary on that. You've done a lot of work on that. You've written on that. And as we heard from the UN's Deputy Secretary General, Amina Mohammed, China's efforts in that regard frame the UN's primary development goal, which was no poverty. Um, how important was that achievement, not just for China, but the example that it set for the rest of the world? President Xi Jinping has made poverty alleviation, as he said, his most important uh, activity. He said, I spend more time on poverty alleviation than on anything else, which is a remarkable statement from any world leader. And President Xi put his uh, feet where his words were, visiting dozens and dozens of poor villages uh, th <clears throat> throughout the, his, his uh, term of office. Uh, poverty alleviation was uh, arguably the most important factor in reaching what in China's called Xiaokang Xiaohui, the moderately prosperous society, which was China's goal by 2020, set around 2010, which um, originally was double the GDP per capita or income per capita in 2020 as opposed to 2010, which is a great goal. But President Xi amplified that by saying we must have every person out of extreme poverty because China cannot claim to be a uh, moderately prosperous society, even if the GDP per capita was very high, if there were still people living in extreme poverty. And as the, the uh, remarkable uh, uh, elimination of poverty has occurred, if we look back over these 45 or so years, uh, the vast majority originally was just by economic development. Economic development alone brought six, seven hundred million or more people out of poverty. Sure, there was some poverty alleviation efforts, but the, but the focus was on uh, uh, general development. When President Xi took office, 
that he began to realize as the country that no matter how much China would grow, no matter how much the GDP capita would grow, there would still be about 100 million Chinese people who would never get out of extreme poverty because of living in remote mountainous villages uh, or lack of education or infirm or other kinds of, uh, of problems. So he began a targeted or a precision poverty alleviation campaign, which is what I spent several years following, a remarkable uh, national commitment. Uh, and it was uh, at, at the highest possible level. Officials couldn't be promoted until they met their goals. It was a remarkable achievement. And indeed, by the end of 2020, uh, uh, virtually everyone in China was lifted above extreme poverty. That's not to say there's not still relative poverty and therefore the transition to what's called common prosperity, which is a multi-decade approach to right. roughly balance the standards of living between urban and rural areas. Robert, the one other challenge, food security. How is China approaching that? Chinese leaders have traditionally always said that their biggest worry is food security. Um, and that certainly has uh, featured in President Xi's uh, approach, as it has previous leaders. Um, if you look at the party documents, uh, which has this year at the 20th Party Congress emphasized security as a, an overarching uh, concept, food security is very much uh, among them. One of the provisions uh, in terms of use of land, there's very specific uh, requirements and restrictions about limiting agricultural land because, in general, uh, local areas can uh, uh, monetize land by selling it to local developers for apartments or various kinds of commercial activities, um, but that would put at risk uh, food security. Uh, China does not want to be dependent on any other country uh, for its food security. So there are many specifics along those lines. Enrique, the World Bank uh, has a new report in which it says that it would be difficult for the world to end poverty by 2030. And of course, you add to that predictions that we've just had from the IMF which tells us that global GDP is going to drop below 2%. Um, given those conditions, what can you tell us about the situation in a country like Mexico? Well, I, first of all, I would agree very much with the idea that uh, humanity has a lot to learn from the experiences of China in the last 40 to 50 years, you know, since the reform and opening up uh, the, the eradication and alleviation of absolute poverty uh, in China is a critical uh, experience for the rest of the world and for other regions such as Latin America and for countries such as Mexico. No, I would fully agree that economic development is probably the most important topic. Uh, and making this more concrete, economic development going beyond quantity and highlighting the issue of quality of development, no? And on the other hand, highlighting also the importance of infrastructure. I think both issues, more quality, less quantity, more infrastructure, is fundamental for other regions of the world in terms of a learning process. Uh, and what does this mean for a country such as Mexico as part of Latin America, as you uh, uh, asked? No? So the situation in Latin America, according to, I remind to institutions such as ECLAC, the Economic Commission for, uh, for Latin America and the Caribbean. They highlight that in 2022, uh, you still have almost one third of the population living under absolute poverty, 2022. So again, the eradication of poverty is a fundamental economic development goal. Very difficult. I unfortunately believe uh, it will be uh, not only difficult, but practically impossible to be achieved in uh, 2030. Even for bigger countries such as Argentina, Brazil, including Mexico. As a matter of fact, in the last three years since COVID, uh, absolute poverty has increased. In the case of Mexico, only last year by almost two million inhabitants. No, uh, so uh, the lack of growth.
<clears throat> uh, but particularly the lack of economic development and the lack of uh, spending more in infrastructure uh, has become an important limitation uh, to decrease uh, 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 and uh, uh, alleviate uh, and eradicate absolute poverty under the current COVID-19 pandemic. No? Chung Wawu, the Kunming Declaration on Biodiversity was adopted by more than 100 countries in 2021 during the first phase of COP15. And China has continuously made the point that development and sustainability go hand in hand. And it was a point that was amplified by the UN Secretary General Antonio Guterres in his address to the COP15 conference that's taking place in Montreal. Let's listen to what the Secretary General had to say. Nature is humanity's best friend. Without nature, we have nothing. Without nature, we are nothing. And yet, humanity seems hell-bent on destruction. We are waging war on nature. And this conference is about the urgent task of making peace. Because today, we are out of harmony with nature. So, Chang Wawu, what are your expectations from the Montreal gathering? Well, I think not only my expectations, the global expectation is that at the end of the negotiation by around December uh, 19th, global community will be able to really adopt a post-2020 global biodiversity framework. Within that framework, we have already have shared uh, goals and the uh, targets uh, such as halt and reverse uh, the loss of nature and uh, we need to sustainably utilize uh, the genetic biological resources make sure we also uh, share uh, equitably the benefits of using those resources and uh, very importantly we need to come up with the means of imp implementation for whatever the goals and the targets we agreed at the end uh, that's mostly meaning particularly uh, meaning finance and uh, uh, developed countries are supporting developing countries, particularly with the financial resources and the technology there as well, in order to make sure collectively, collectively we'll be able to really protect uh, the biological diversity, the ecosystems, which are pretty much support our lives and the livelihoods there. At this moment, and China, as the presidency of COP15, continues to support, to lead and support the global process. And we also recognize how difficult it is at this moment. Uh, there are about 22 targets, uh, you know, uh, in that draft at this moment. But somehow, with many, many brackets, the negotiation started already. Somehow, I'm hoping the uh, global community will recognize the sense of urgency, sense of crisis, and really coming towards a more uh, agreement and uh, really putting their commitments at the highest political will to make sure we have something to act towards uh, for this decade. Robert Lawrence Kuhn, President Xi Jinping also talked uh, about the relationship between nature development and sustainability at the 20th Party Congress. He said, we must uphold and act on the principle that lucid waters and lush mountains are invaluable assets and we must remember to maintain harmony between humanity and nature when planning out development. So Robert, how do you see China's priorities on setting the agenda for the multitude of environmental challenges that the world faces today? First of all, it's instructive to understand the development of the um, policy that now uh, pervades China in terms of the environment. And one really needs to start back with President Xi Jinping, who obviously sets the overarching policy uh, for the party and for the country. Uh, indeed, that quote that you had uh, goes back to his original quote when he was party secretary of Zhejiang province from 2002 to 2007. He said, something exactly to that effect that uh, 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 clear waters or lush waters and uh, green mountains at that point he said are just as valuable as mountains of gold and silver so that was the original quote uh, i met with president xi when he was party secretary of Zhejiang in 2006 and he very specifically told me then 
this was before he even came to Beijing as vice president, uh, of the importance of, of the environment and the complexity of balancing economic development with environmental protection. Uh, so it goes back to that time. Then the next date I'll point out is 2015, where early in his uh, uh, first term, when he developed what then was called the five major concepts of development, or as it is known today, the new concept of development, in which there were five overarching concepts to drive economic development. But what was the innovation there was that the third, the first was innovation, second coordination, uh, the skip ahead, the fourth was, uh, um, uh, 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 the fifth was uh, sharing, and the, the, uh, the fourth was openness. The third was green. Now, this was the first time in arguably Chinese history that the environment was lifted to the top level of uh, uh, national priority. And that was set in 2015. And from that point, the environment became a critical factor uh, in driving everything that was in China. Prior to that, people talked about the environment. There were environmental laws on the books, but they were violated quite easily, uh, oftentimes through bribery or various other kinds of things. Nobody took it seriously. Penalties were very mild in the past, and so it was cheap for companies to pollute, get a very small fine, and then continue to pollute. Uh, that changed dramatically. And so the condition in China today is very, very different. And once again, China has gone through this process, and it's a process that can be used as a model not to be transported to every other country. Each country has its own culture and history and environmental conditions, of course. But the model of how China dealt with its, its problems over the years, and, there's, and, and it's com very complex. And I think, you know, we make a mistake by just looking at the end result and saying how wonderful things are. But one needs to really go through the process and understand the, the tensions involved, because there were pressures on economic development. And uh, both, it really, and so the change in China came from both the top and the bottom. It was mentioned before that the pressure of the people uh, 10 or so years ago, and, you know, if you lived in Beijing, the pollution was, was, was horrendous. And, and so you had pressure from the bottom, and then President Xi setting the guidelines from the top, and everyone else in the, in the middle, the, the elite, the bureaucracy, the heads of state-owned enterprises, finally got the, the message. and. Uh, um, uh, um, uh, punishments became serious, and the, the, the country took it very seriously. And so those kinds of messages, it's important. So it's important to understand the historical development in China and the complexity of making it happen. Eric Solheim, um, green development is also one of the top priorities uh, for China's Belt and Road Initiative. How is that being achieved? Let me first... Uh tell you how much I agree with the view that President Xi is among the most environment-conscious leaders in the world today. He speaks about environment, I think, much more than basically any other leader in the world. Uh, and that's so important, because leadership from the top uh, is critical if you want to change. And you added, you need the people to be with you and, and, to, and to force ahead. And uh, among all his slogans, the one I really love is the slogan of a beautiful China. Because that can, of course, be translated into beautiful America, beautiful India, beautiful Germany, whatever. But it's a positive slogan. It's not about everything we should avoid, all the threats and fears. That is the uh, patriotic slogan of making your nation beautiful. And uh, it taps into the law for nature, uh, which every person feels, and translate that into action. And we now see that China is by far the biggest tree planter in the world. President Xi has promised that China will plant an area the size of Belgium every year from now to, now to 2030. NASA, the American Space Agency, tells us that the main reason why the planet is going greener, the surface of the planet is becoming greener, that is tree planting uh, in China. And you have amazing examples like Sai Hanba in Hebei province or Kubuchi Desert in, in the Mongolia. These were very dry, basically destroyed areas which are now going back to becoming green in a beautiful fashion. And you also see giant pandas coming back in Sichuan, snow leopards coming back in Western China, and by the way, also in Central Asia, all thanks to good efforts. So I think this slogan of capturing the love of nature and the beauty, 
that is very powerful and Belt and Road can be used as a vehicle for that. Of course, Belt and Road at the core is a vehicle for investment to provide Chinese investment in railroads and roads or environment protection or solar energy, wind energy in the world. But Belt and Road is also an opportunity for people to people to contact right. and to learn from each other. And I think the slogan, beautiful China, we should translate into every other language of the world. Enrique Dussel Peters, uh, China has also invested very heavily uh, through the Belt and Road Initiative in Latin America, particularly in the renewable energy sector. What can you tell us about these efforts? Well, uh, as we, in, at our center, we have been working on this concept of a globalization process with Chinese characteristics in which infrastructure and uh, overseas foreign direct investment play a critical role in this global community of shared future, as highlighted uh, since the Belt and Road Initiative since 2013. And so Latin America and the Caribbean and China have a group of different institutions, bilateral institutions, uh, such as the ECLAC China Forum. ECLAC is the a, a community of Latin American and Car Caribbean states uh, that has been working for for several for more than a de almost a decade now and one of the mo most dynamic uh, uh, relationships and factors between china and latin america in addition to infrastructure projects has been have been china's uh, investment in the region to have an idea until 2021 and these are some statistics that we have been elaborating there are lots of methodology issues uh, which generate very different statistics. But China has invested in the region, Latin America and the Caribbean, more than 172 billion US dollars all over the region. And they have generated, this investment have generated almost 600,000 jobs. Energy has become one of the critical topics of uh, uh, China's foreign direct investment in the last 10 years, and particularly in the more recent period, 40% in the recent period of China's uh, FDI have gone to energy. And out of the full amount of China's uh, foreign direct investment in energy, uh, half of this 50% have gone to uh, non-fossil uh, energy sources, no? which includes wind, uh, uh, but uh, also uh, solar energy, hydroelectric power plants, among others. No? Uh, and very interestingly, uh, in the last uh, five years, China's foreign direct investment in the region have very substantially diversified by country, but also by sector, and again, uh, in new uh, non fossil energy sources, and they have become a very important uh, source of dynamics in the respective uh, countries, particularly in countries such as Chile, Peru, and Mexico. No? So this is a very positive aspect, I would say, of this global development initiative and the Belt and Road Initiative very concretely between uh, the region and China. Changwa Wu, sustainability was at the heart of the uh, Winter Olympics uh, in Beijing. All the venues were powered by renewable sources, uh, and much of the infrastructure that was built in for the 2008 Summer Olympics was repurposed for these uh, Winter Olympics. Um, what can you tell us about this project, and why was it so important for China to have these games be carbon neutral and green? Well, large international sports events are good opportunities to, on one side, actually, when you're preparing for the events itself, uh, it's a good opportunity to drive innovation, to try out, you know, lots of new technologies, new systems, stuff like that. In the meantime, of course, you do need to showcase uh, what works and what the outcomes that could be delivered through those innovations, through those planning, you know, particular carbon neutrality. Uh, at this moment. Uh, the 2022 Winter Olympic is one example, uh, but 
if you look at 2008, the Summer Olympics, the Beijing Summer Olympics, that was another major uh, sort of showcase or innovation there as well. If you look at it today, if you look at uh, electric vehicles, particularly electric buses, uh, fuel cell technologies, uh, building efficiency, uh, you know, energy management system, and also a lot of digital solutions that have been applied, tried out and applied in those two events, they are pretty much becoming uh, more and more mainstream to practice uh, in today's sort of infrastructure, in today's products and the services there already. Uh, so aiming high, not, not only to China, I think in the International Olympics Committee has also embraced the carbon neutrality, environment friendly, resource efficiency as a major part of the uh, you know, sports event globally. And China definitely has been a major partner, not only to support that, but also really practicing and delivering the models that could be shared right. uh, for future events. Robert Lawrence Kuhn, how much of a balancing act is it for China to try and maintain high rates of growth while at the same time not sacrificing the environment and compromising its biodiversity and sustainability goals? There's a natural tension, of course, between economic development and environmental pollution uh, that people have assumed are polar opposites. Uh, President Xi has made the point, as we said, that uh, a good environment can be valuable resources. And I would point out a very specific example in its early days. Uh, go back to the, the middle of the last decade. Uh, in 2016, I actually did a, a very detailed survey of Zhejiang province uh, in terms of their environmental uh, activities and, their, and the innovations. And it is a, um, a confluence, actually, of the anti-poverty campaign and the anti-pollution campaign because the anti-poverty campaign had five different general modalities that would bring people out of poverty, including uh, starting business, micro businesses, education, etc. But one of them was uh, what's called echo compensation. It sounds like a strange word, but it was developed, and Zhejiang was a pioneer in this, in which in bringing people out of poverty in, in rural areas, particularly where, where the, there was a rich environment, the government was willing to spend money and invest so that those areas could develop uh, environmental friendly businesses, such as tourism, um, such as the development of uh, bamboo into a major industry, which Anji County, for example, in Zhejiang province, uh, uh, transformed from, from uh, uh, small little chemical companies that were polluting everything. They shut it down. And in one county, the, the income dropped 90 percent because these little companies, which were horrendously polluting, were shut down. And it took time by the government investing through this echo compensation program. Thank you all for joining us. It has been a fascinating discussion. We have much more to bring you during our special programming, Global Action Initiative 2022 on Sustainability. And for more of our GAI content, you can check out our website, cgtnamerica.com slash GAI, or scan the QR code. In 2021, the world was captivated when a herd of wild Asian elephants in China's Yunnan province migrated north in search of forage. The herd eventually returned to its original habitat. Over the last three decades, conservationists at the Asian Elephant Sanctuary have rescued over 20 elephants. In a special CGTN documentary on biodiversity, we hear from Shen Ching Zhong, the director of China's National Nature Reserve.这个项目的二期建设就是要为它还要营造更大的空间最后让它能够进口能够给我们的项目方面能够一个改变让它建设这种进来性这个是一个另外一个还要跟外边的这个影像群啊这种关系的改善就是说不跟我不跟人去做了
To learn more about the wild Asian elephants and other biodiversity efforts in China, be sure to watch the documentary, Big Story, Balance, Biodiversity in China. You can find it online at america.cgtn.com. Just click on the Big Story tab. Over the next few days, CGTN America's Global Action Initiative on Sustainability will highlight how China and the world are working towards a more sustainable future. We'll hear from pro athletes, entrepreneurs and the youth. Our special coverage continues next with CGTN America premiere, Sustainable in the U.S.